Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize that either, but yeah. yeah. But, but next week, uh, if you have kids, they're out for the whole week. For the whole week so. we're, yeah, I know. But we're it's not it's budget week. stuff. Oh. They, can, they can't afford to send our kids to school for the whole year anymore. <laughs> Yeah, it would have been great. They get so much time off now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't get off. Friday, Monday, so it's a four day weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. But, but I mean, you know, this is normal. Oh, yeah. Normal lecture this, you know, Wednesday, oh. normal lecture next yeah. Wednesday. I mean, all that's the same. But this Monday's a holiday. You know, um, and I know that, I think I told you the story anyway, that, you know, like on President's Week, all the kids are out of school. And, and, and I don't mind if you bring your kids to class as long as they're not noisy or something like that. They'll make all sorts of obscene noises or something. But, but, um, and I occasionally would bring my kid, my, my nine year old son, but was still with me. And I think I told you the story. I brought her, I brought her to class one day. Yeah, it was last semester. <laughs> you didn't and, tell us that. Tell you the story. No, no, no. She's nine year old, my nine year old, she, she, she goes, uh, so she said she wanted to go to class. You know, she wanted to come to school, but she was not school that So I said, okay. And I said, but you know, I want you to sit in class. So she, she sat in the back and she kept walking out and walking back. And <laughs> after, after class was over, I said, so, how was the lecture? She goes, Boeing. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you know, make them all happy. Yeah, no. I said, besides that, you probably speak with the entire class. So, so, yeah. so the other thing is, I, I unfortunately got some bug this weekend, so I was feeling caught coming. And I even have, I'm sort of still sort of stuffed up. I don't think I'm contagious, or I wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. But my energy level, as I mentioned to my morning lab, is lower than usual, which makes it about normal for most people because my energy level is so high anyway, even in my advanced age. So. So I think I'm okay. I think I can still handle this. Steve, by the way, has put the lectures up on, uh, have you gotten that in, under my CR? Yeah, yeah, if they're under messages. I was thinking about if you guys really wanted to, uh, it's, there's an option for me to send everyone an email with the, with the links with in the it. Links. If you guys want that, um, I would say message me individually and say that. If I get like 12, 15 people, I'm just sending it to all of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and and by the way, I, since I'm giving the same lecture in, the, in my other class, um, you can I use all the links to them. Okay, awesome. And, and uh, as I said in my little message to you guys, uh, uh, I'm a little, little yeah. comments are are not shut down. You can leave them; they have to no. be improved. So basically, we're going with what Thumper said that if you don't have nothing nice to say, don't say nothing at all. <laughs> or I'll shut them down all the way if you. Okay. <laughs> And They're and shut down right now as, okay, as it stands. Good, good, good. And, and the thing is, you know, as I said, I'm a little skittish about having this go out to the you know, universe here. Um, but, but, uh, and the thing is, of course, you know, Steve's really on his laptop, so it's hard to see what's written on the board. Yeah. But you can hear the thing. And, and, and I don't really expect it to be a substitute for a lecture, but in case you miss a lecture and you... I recommend, which I put in a note, I think, on the message or something. Mm -hmm. I recommend that you get a a the copies of the notes from somebody, and, and then if you yeah. look went on to this, then you could hear me explain things. So, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I found hearing the teacher explain something helped a lot more than just reading it on notes. Especially if you forgot what he said and you get to see it again later, because I, yeah. I did. Like I almost watched your whole lecture again for a third time because. You yeah, actually are pretty good at lecturing, but um. okay. So as long as I mean, as long as it's sinking in, yeah. And all that kind of stuff. So anyway, whatever. So I, I, I uh, you know, I, I'm really glad you're doing this, and it'd be mm -hmm. nice if we had, uh, you know, a nice camera. To do it. I, it's in San Diego. But, but, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> bringing that. Yeah. Any questions <laughs> before we start? Uh, uh, just, any questions before we start?
God, my morning lab was so quiet today. I don't know. You guys, are you going to be... Is it a plain biology lab or is I it a... I want you to be alive. I want you to be... Did you ever see that cartoon from... from oh, God, it is Trudeau... Uh, 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 Doonesbury? Oh. And, and this, 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 you know, the professor is up there lecturing away and, and no one's saying anything. No one's responding. They're all just trying to figure it out. So he finally decides he's going to start saying all these outrageous things. He just starts making up all this stuff. I mean, it's totally, totally outrageous, you know. And, and he's hoping to get a response. And everyone's just kind of sitting there. And then one of them, Zonker, well, I think his cousin, whoever goes, wow, this is some really cool stuff. I didn't know this stuff before. <laughs> <laughs> they were just accepting everything he said, these guys. I'd like you guys to, you know, think about things. And if I say something you don't agree with or you don't understand or whatever, you can show this. Okay, I, I gave you, why did I give you a copy? And I ran out of copies. Uh, but the, oh, the, the, the test is two weeks from Wednesday, right? Mm -hmm. Let's write this down. Make sure you remember this. Oh. First exam. Two weeks from Wednesday. That's February. I mean, March 6th. Is that what you're saying? No, it's February 26th. February 26th. Mm -hmm. Two weeks from Wednesday. But I still have found a location for the study session. Wednesday, February 26th. And I gave you the uh, study guide, mm -hmm. and it's on my CR. I made copies to hand out if you're here. You uh, copied this guy. I uh, ran out of copies, so I'm, I, but I'll get some and I'll have it for Wednesday. So if you didn't get a copy, I, you know, you can download it and just print it. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't mind making copies. Of it. Um, so, all right, so that's the thing. Uh, <laughs> it'll be just written, it'll be, uh, you know, just right on the test. You know, uh, and there'll be a lot of little explanations or things. It'll be about everything you've covered. But I was looking through it and I realized I forgot a couple of stuff that you mentioned. It's not a big deal. It's something you could have figured out on your own anyway. But I thought I would at least do it. Functions of the macromolecules. What were the macromolecules? Do you remember? Carbohydrates. Flour? Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates. That's a good one. Carbohydrates. What was the other one? Proteins. Proteins. Yeah. What was that? Receptors, I heard that. Yes, receptors, yes. <laughs> that wasn't quite the right answer, but that's okay. That's a good try. Nu uh, what, nucleic, nucleic acids. And then, and then one that's not officially a macromolecule, but we still talk about it, lipids, okay? Now, the, the, what I didn't talk about was the functions of it, but uh, you know most of these anyway. But I, this, this is what some, some of the functions. We're not going to put a complete list of some functions. Okay, so carbohydrates. Yeah. Good. Any ideas? Energy. Energy, sure. Yeah. You can use them. You can use them for energy. Okay, energy, that'd be good. Structure. A lot of, lot, lot of structural aspects of it. Um, other kinds of things. That I'm not going to put this down, but actually, receptors was the right answer. <laughs> the, uh, just for your interest, I won't write this up here, but just for your interest, it, uh, I think someone mentioned blood types last time, if I remember. But anyway, um, you know, we have the so called A, B, O blood types, your type mm -hmm. A, type B, type A, B, or type O. The difference between those blood types is, is a receptor in is a membrane protein. I won't use the word receptor, so receptor. It's a membrane protein in the red blood cell. And, the, and the, the, the actual protein, and you don't need to know this with my class, I'm just telling you this, but the actual membrane protein that di differentiates type A from type B, very similar. The protein part's very similar, but it's actually a glycoprotein. Glyco meaning sugar. sugar. It's got some sugars attached to that protein, seven sugars. And to be type A, it would be the A kind of protein, or those sugars are a certain kind of sugar, and to be B, they're slightly different sugars. I mean, a whole bunch of sugars, by the way. You know. So, and so that, that's what actually differentiates type A from type B, and type O doesn't have those four sugars. So, so, um, and and 
You say, gosh, they're almost the same, that, those, those molecules. They are almost the same. But it's enough difference, just those little four sugars, enough difference that your immune response can recognize it as something different. So that's why if you're type A, you don't want type B blood or vice versa. You just get all kinds of clumping and yeah, never mind, we'll get into it. But it's not good, obviously. So, you know, for, for, for transfusion, you want to have the same kind of blood. So, anyway. So, so you know, these are just some of the functions. Energy, structure, proteins. We can say energy again because uh, you can break down proteins for energy that we hear all the time. And also for structure. But structure, we can break down yeah. structure. Build stuff. Plus all kinds of other functions. Right? Uh, you know, because what do we know about proteins? There is a worker molecule. Yeah. I'll say enzymes, receptors, you could have done that, <laughs> uh, channels and pumps, etc, 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 I mean there's a whole bunch of things, plus a whole bunch of things. What about nucleic acids, DNA and RNA? <sighs> and those are the instructions, those, okay, those, so those, are, those are the blueprints, man. Yeah, okay, so we can say these are for, for, um, <laughs> Let's say genetic material, mm -hmm. which we'll learn more about. We're going to talk more about this genetic material. Um, I'll put the word material there. Uh, genetic material. Um, yeah, that's a main, well, you know, get information. We'll refer to that way. That boy is unique. So we will go into details. Lipids. What about lipids? Certainly energy. <coughs> Structure. Uh, it's also, you know, lipids combined with things like proteins that, or, or various things, various functions. But you can always look like energy and structure for most of these things. So, anyway, that's, that's I don't want to get a whole lot of detail. Insulation? I'm sorry, say it again. To combine insulation? Insulation, you could use the word insulation, but, you know, um, barrier or something like that. We could use the word barrier, that's fine. Oh, I guess I would put barrier uh, uh, under and structure, structure yeah. maybe even insulation under structure too. I don't know. I don't care. Whatever you want to say. But yeah, let's say it. I like the insulation actually because when you think about it, um, you know the marine mammals, you know whales and dolphins, and yeah, and, uh, walruses and all these things. They have thick layer of what we call blubber, um, but it's just a layer. Of Adipose tissue to have where insulation is to withstand an incredibly cold environment. There. Um, I mean, we all, all mammals store some fat under their skin. It's quite normal. But in the case of the marine mammals, we're so cold and you could lose heat so fast, it's important that they store a lot. And give you an example um, the uh, the seals. I look, I think I'm trying to remember which kind of seal. But there's a particular seal. Well, it, 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 they're born on ice floes in the in the in the Arctic. It's a particular seal. I forget which seal right now. Okay. The little baby, the little pup, nurses for four days only. It's born on the ice floe. Now we're talking it's incredibly cold, right? Born on the ice floe. It nurses for four days. Mom's milk, the mother's milk, is 60% fat. Okay, now human milk is about 3% fat. Okay, so, so we're talking incredibly fatty milk, 60% fat. Um, and in those four days, the little baby gains 45 pounds. Almost all of it's blubber. Because right after that, it has to go into the water and survive the, those temperatures, which yeah, is the hard above zero. And swim around and start getting other things. But that's impressive. I mean, that's 45 pounds in four days of mostly blubber. You know, so. Anyway, pretty incredible. So that's definitely insulation. Yes, yes. Okay, anyway, so that's just a, a short thing about that. I want to say something about animal cells versus plant cells. Just, just because you've been looking at plant cells in the... Um, and we look at animal cells in the lab, we also plant cells. But so, you know, we look at, um, let's just take an animal cell there, such as the cheek cell. Um, so, and it's got a little nucleus there, okay. And the plant cell. 
not all animal cells are just exactly that shape. So by the way, cheek cells are clearly flat. They look, look like that. Way, they're yeah. big. If you look at them sideways, they're really flat. That's not the case for all animal cells. Some will be some will be a different shape, but that's typically cheek cell. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's got a cell membrane, it's a normal old cell membrane. It's flexible. When they pack together, these cells all pack together. Uh, you know, you've seen honeycombs. Uh, they, they pack together like a honeycomb. It's called hexagonal close packing. If you ever want to get talk about that. But they'll, they'll pack together like this, in, in hexagons. Now, when you t take it off of your, you know, you scrape it off your cheek, it, it's sloughing off, and so you don't see it. So you just see an individual cell, and then it's, you know, it's free to be any shape, more or less. And, and they're very flexible the membranes, all fold and everything. If you look at them under the microscope, you saw there are a bunch of them flop together. Yeah, yeah. Some of them folded over, and that's normal. Um, plant cells, of course, have cell membranes. All cells have cell membranes. That's something you want to keep in mind. All cells have cell membranes. If the cell membrane is destroyed, <coughs> it's cell. cell dead. So all cells have cell membranes. Um, so let's say here's a plant cell, like the L and D that you look at. But it's got a tough cell wall on the outside. I'm leaving kind of a space there, but it's got a cell wall. So let's say this is cell membrane in black. Um, so the cell wall, you know, is tough, strong stuff. It's, uh, what's it made of? <coughs> what is it? What is it? Cellulose, yes. Yeah. <laughs> cytoplasm. Um, and, and, and what is it? What is it? Cytoplasm? It's inside there. Oh, chloroplast. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chloroplast. chloroplast. But, 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 but it's, it's got the, you know, it's got this tough cell wall, which allows it to, you know, make things like trees that can grow, you know, hundreds of feet tall. Because you've got this tough, strong cell wall. Um, so animal cells don't have cell walls. No animal cell has a cell wall. Plant cells, yes, they have cell walls. Um, fungi, they, many fungi have cell walls. Uh, what are some other things? Some, uh, I don't know if there's anything on algae or some cell wall. Bacteria, most bacteria have cell walls. They're made of different things. So let's just say this. So cell walls, so, so we'll say uh, plant cells, plant cells, Fungi, most bacteria, most fungi, I should say most fungi, most, most bacteria, okay, have cell walls, okay, um, they're made of different things, I mean the cell wall of the plant cells is different from bacterial cell walls, and that's different from fungal cell walls, they're all different. But, but, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they, uh, they uh, what's it, what's the deal with cell walls? What's it? I mentioned about plants. They can grow really tall, but fungi don't grow tall. Bacteria, tiny little guys. What would be an advantage of a cell wall? Is it because whatever's into the cell, like, if it gets too big, it will, like, so the animal cell mm -hmm. is like, what it is, so the cell wall allows it to, like, grow and I'm not quite sure what you're saying, but I think I think what you're saying is sort of right. Like it allows I allows the cells to live, like yeah, yeah. The yeah. Cell dies but there's no wall to it. But you know what? Ha let me let me tell you another thing though. Well, go ahead. I want to hear what you. Um, um, water off. Yeah, water. The cells use water in order to structure. Okay, and 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 it's it's you're you're right. And if it gains water, <coughs> okay. So here's the thing. For example, most back now. See so this today's lab or tonight's lab. So was, you guys are Tuesday, Thursday, right? Mm -hmm. So your lab tomorrow, Thursday, is dealing with osmosis and diffusion. I'm going to say a little bit about that um, today in lecture. Uh, but most bacteria live in a hypofine environment. 
which means, and I'm going to get back to this word, so I'm not going to write it up right now, but which means that, that water wants to go into the cell. And if it's an animal cell, like a red blood cell, the water is going into it in the swell and it can burst. But the bacteria don't burst because they've got that tough cell wall. The same thing with the, the plant cells, the fungal cells, they wouldn't burst because they've got the tough cell wall. If you put them in a high salt environment that can draw the water out, that's one of the things we do in the lab, is you're taking the LED plant, a cell, you know, a little sprig of it, and you're putting it in a high salt and it'll draw the water out of the cell. And you see the cell membrane pulling away from you know, the cell wall and you see all the chloroplasts, you know, blobbing up. I know blobbing up is not a scientific term, but you know, you know what I'm So, so, it, but it doesn't, it, even, even if you lose water, It'll still maintain the shape and everything. And if you gain water, you can only gain a certain amount of water because it then it gets to be, you know, it'll pop. It, it won't get. It can only get to a certain pressure if that's tough cell wall. And it won't burst, but but uh, and you get back pressure, so it can't get much more. But in an animal cell, you know, if you put a, an animal cell like a red blood cell in water, water goes into it, the cell gets bigger and bursts. So they can't withstand that. So you know, cell membranes aren't terribly tough. Um, cell walls are tough, so you can see this. So, this, so cell walls good for structure. Anyway, the other thing about the, the, um, plants have everything that animal cells have, all the same uh, things they have. So let's say plant cells, plant cell um, has the same <coughs> organelles. Uh, as plant cell, as animal cells. So plant cells, uh, I'll say have, I'll put, put, put. plant cells have the same organelles as animal cells plus chloroplasts, right? Plus chloroplasts. And of course, what are chloroplasts for? Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, yeah? Okay. Did it, was there a question, by the way? So no animal cells photosynthesize. Except for the phytoplankton. Yeah. Uh, I was I saw something I don't know it was some article in Scientific America and it was the examining the the half plant half animal cell. Oh, what is that? Uh, I I it, it was I don't know was it phytoplankton? I, I didn't have time to read the whole article. I skimmed it, but I'll probably go back okay. and look at it. Well, no, go ahead. There's a slug <clears throat> that they just recently found that does photosynthesize and the bottom of it actually looks like a leaf. Is it that what it was? The cells to it is a slug. But now, did it swallow <clears throat> some, some plant cells and got the chloroplast from it or what? No. You need to find out what you need to know. You're talking about <laughs> it might be like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But see, most of the time when that, cause, because they're, you know, algae, of course, photosynthesize. Uh, and sometimes the algae will get together with some other cells and, and all that. So I wonder if it's a symbiotic kind of thing, relationship. It's, it's, yeah, find out, let me know. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, and, and not necessarily, they don't necessarily start that way. They probably happens after the, uh, the cells are, are formed. But it'd be interesting to find out. So in general, in general, so you know, it may be that we will find out that there's some cells in But in general, then... You know, no animal cells don't photosynthesize, plant cells do. And they, they, they do it because they have these little things called chloroplasts. We'll talk about this in the future, next couple of weeks or so. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, um, I think it might be an obvious symbiosis, but a lot of reefs photosynthesize. Yeah, you say reef. Reef structure, like so, but, corals. Yeah, but the corals, now that is, I think, th those are animal cells. And I think you're right. I think it, it's in, it, they're in a symbiotic relationship with some algae. I think that's right. You know, there's weird, see, there's all kinds of interesting symbiotic relationships that, that for example, lichens, if you've heard of lichens. Yeah, all of it. That's, that's a combination of a fungus, a fungus, and either a blue-green bacterium or an al a true algae, oh, yeah. an algae. Um, and, and, and they can live in environments that most cells can't live in, like on a surface of a rock, you know. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, well, how do they live on the surface of a rock? Well, there's a symbiotic relationship between the fungus and either the blue-green or a regular alga. Uh, and those animals, the, the, the fungus helps to hold the alga in place and gets it to stick to the rock. 
and uh, and then the the blue green is is photosynthesizing, is providing some nutrients to to the fungus, um, and so you know together they're they're really helping out each other. And before I get your before I get your thing, I know I hear, but what I was going to say, I want you. To, does anyone know who was the first person to prove that a lichen is a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and an alga, or a fungus and a blue green? Does anyone know? And you may have read some of her stories when you were little, like the tale of Peter Rabbit and the tale of Benjamin Bunny and the tale of who's that? Beatrix, Beatrix Potter. Beatrix Potter is mostly known these days for writing little stories and illustrating them. She she illustrated these, and it was some of her nieces and nephews who said you should publish them. So that's what she's known for now. But she was an amateur. So listen to that word, amateur. And listen to the other part of that sentence. She was an amateur um, uh, biologist. And she did some brilliant work on lichens and proved that they were the symbiotic relationship. And she wrote up some papers to submit to the Royal Society. This is in England. They're even more prejudiced than we are, I think, in this, in this country. And, and so she had two strikes against her. One, she, female. Yeah. Two, she wasn't professionally trained. She wasn't university trained. She was an amateur. So they wouldn't accept her papers. So later, it was, you know, other people proved it, and then they went back and said, hey, she did it first. So she was the first one to prove it. So anyway, it was just my question. Now, back to, did you look it up? Yes. So What's they say? eat the algae, and yeah. they line the inside of their stomachs with the photosynthetic cells, and then they use them. And, this, and, 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 this, and the, the, it's, uh, I guess, transparent enough that they can get yeah. But, yeah, and that's what I thought. It was a simple observation, but they they, yeah, they eat it. They don't they don't start out. With it. Yeah, so I figured. But it's it's really wild because you know even on sometimes polar bears you'll see on the their 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 um, nice white fur will have kind of green stuff on it. That's algae now. They're not the polar bears not getting any you know, algae in that case, but but the uh, algae are getting a place to live on the polar bear fur. You know. but yeah, yeah, it's really that's what there's, there's the same kind of. Is this as actual slug? You mean like the yeah, it is a slug. The kind of slugs we have here in South Africa. I mean, I mean, it's that kind of slug, like a, like the good old. It's a sea slug. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Does it give a name? Yeah, it's uh, Alicia chlorotica. Yeah. So uh, the last the genus was Alicia. No, that was what? Chlorotica. Chlorotica. C H L O R. And for color, because they've got that color. Interesting. I'll see if I can read it with that. So. But I figured it was probably a symbiotic thing. Yeah, that's wild. Anyway, the other kinds of things, so, so they have, the, the, the uh, plant cells have the, uh, chloroplasts, and those are large things. Those are green. I don't know what green color but they might indicate. But those are fairly large, you know, so they, they're, 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 big, they're big, big. And what we'll talk about in the future, so that they'll, they'll have a nucleus in here too, of course, there'd be a nucleus. And then these things would be like the chloroplasts. And then typically what, what uh, plants have in the center is this what they call a central vacuole. And I, I, I have to admit, when I was young, I never really quite understood the central vacuole because the fact that they call it vacuole, I thought meant that it was empty. But it's actually not empty. It's actually filled with water, it's got nutrients and stuff like that. So I guess the central vacuole is really just a storage space for nutrients or something like that. I know you probably can't read that, I'm sorry. It's not a big deal because I'm not going to ask you that. I'm just really telling you about it. So when you're looking like in the Elodea cell, you know, you can see the central vacuole, you can see, if you look at those plants, you, I hope you saw the, the chloroplast going around yeah. that central vacuole. It's it's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, it's well, it's really loud with that yeah, I think that, I think it does probably help to do that. I think you're right. I, I'm, you know, it seems reasonable. Yeah. Anyway, whatever. It's not a big deal for our purposes. When we get to mitosis and cell division, um, we'll see that there's a, it's a little bit different in that it's more or less the same in animals and plants, except that it's easy to make a new membrane, but the, the Plant cells have to make new membranes, but they have to make new cell wall. And I'll say a little bit. I won't go into a whole lot of detail. But it's just a little bit. Uh, yeah. Anyway, 
One other thing I would just did just about the cell walls, since we said that for plants it's, it's, it's um, uh, cellulose, no animal cell makes enzymes to break down cellulose. Um, we don't, we can't break down cellulose, it's just fiber. And you need an enzyme that's called cellulose. Um, and you're going, wait a minute, I thought termites eat cellulose. Yeah, yeah. yeah they do. Um, uh, what about what about uh, uh, sheep and horses and cows? They eat all that alfalfa. So that, by the way, you could eat alfalfa, and uh, you get an awful lot of fiber from eating it. You wouldn't get many nutrients if you eat the you know the sprouts. Okay, you can eat sprouts and get some n nutrients. But if you try to take the regular alfalfa, you know, plant uh, and eat it the way a horse does, or hay, if I eat hay, um, a lot of fiber, no nutrients because you can't break down the cellulose. So how do horses do it if I just said no no, no animal it makes it? Yeah. Yes, it's the rumen bacteria and things like the sheep and stuff like that. They have this whole compartment, you know, where they have all these bacteria. And there are certain bacteria that make cellulase, which breaks down the cellulose. Same thing with termites. One of the things I used to do in my cell biology class, it's really a neat thing to do, actually, and you can easily do it. Get, get a termite and get a slide, put them on a slide and just kind of push on its abdomen and towards the outside and just squeeze out all its stuff from its guts. But I know, it sounds gross, doesn't it? But do you like termites? They eat your houses. You know, you don't like termites. Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't sound like a nice thing to do. But anyway, it, but it's an interesting experiment because there's an entire ecosystem in the termite gut. It contains all kinds of bacteria, including bacteria that break down the cellulose. It contains all kinds of protozoa. And some of those protozoa, only place they live is in termites. I mean, that's what I mean by the entire ecosystem. And different termites have different combinations of protozoa and all that. So it's really kind of wild. It's really wild. But, but when a termite hatches from an egg, when a horse or a cow is in utero, or sheep or whatever, they, they're sterile. They don't have any bacteria. How do termites get the bacteria in their gut? How do horses and cows and so <laughs> sheep get the bacteria for their rumen? The water. And this is going to sound awful because you're going to ew! They eat the poop of the parents. The term for that, coprophagia. Um, but, the, but you know, they, the baby, the baby termite, the you know little termite will eat eat the feces that are around from the parent. You know, other or other termites doesn't have to be the parent to the other termites. Horses, the little baby horses, little baby cows, little baby sheep, they'll eat the poop of their parents, and by doing that, they will get the bacteria into their gut, so they can go ahead and, and uh, break down the cellulose. And without it, if you didn't let them do that, they could not you know the horses or cows or whatever they couldn't get any nutrients out of the you know, the uh, grass, the uh, hay, or alfalfa. So Makes sense? I mean, it's weird. You go, oh, you know what? It's not really weird when you think about it. It's quite practical. Yeah, go ahead. Not that I know of, but I don't want to say. I, I, I hate to give the absolute because I'm not positive. But I don't know of it. My guess is probably not, or maybe small. I'm not sure. Anyway, okay. So let's go on. Um, I want to talk more about membranes. Um, yeah, let's do here, and let's do. I've covered a bunch of things I wanted to. The oh, one thing, one thing about membranes. Remember, I said all cells have cell membranes. Okay. And all cell membranes are made of phospholipids and proteins. Okay, let's actually write this down. So, all cell membranes. Um, are made of phospholipids and proteins. And, and phospholipids are the main lipid in that, you know, that, that lipid bilayer that we talked about. 
But many things like animal cells have uh, cholesterol in, in also in, in, in that fossil in there. They have the cholesterol. Bacteria don't make cholesterol, for example, but, but animal cells have cholesterol. So we'll say um, animal cells also have some some cholesterol. <laughs> and there's some it, it, that is a lipid, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And then there's good ones and bad ones, right? Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll mention them. Or I should say fossil. Um, so there's, there are some differences in, in cell membranes. You know, not... not in terms of animal cells and plant cells and algal cells, so like that, cell membranes are very, are very similar in terms of the lipids, fairly similar. What was different, of course, as I said, was the protein. That's very important because that's what makes the, the uh, difference in the, the way the cells are act, which proteins are in that cell. Cholesterol, I'll just mention real quickly. We need cholesterol. It's important. It's an important molecule. It's a big set of rings and all that. Not that I really need to worry about it, but it, it's. Um, we, we need it in cell membranes, for example, but it's also the, 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 the skeleton molecule to make the steroid hormones. The sex hormones are steroid hormones. Mm -hmm. Vitamin D, it's called a vitamin, it's misnamed. It's actually a steroid hormone. It's not a vitamin at all. Um, uh, it's vitamin D, uh, the hormones from the adrenal cortex, uh, cortisone, for example, uh, and, and so a couple of others. You know, these are all steroid hormones, and they all use cholesterol. As their structural molecule. This is nothing to do with Wilkins' class. Tends to say something about it. Uh, um, so, but cholesterol gets a lot of bad press. And um, the reason is that if you eat a lot of it in your diet, then it can start clogging up your blood vessels. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not a good thing. Um, and it's a, it's a quantity factor. You know? uh, so, and, and, and it's eating a lot of animal fat, eating vegetable. Uh, eating you know, vegetable um, products is not a problem because they don't have all that cholesterol. But animal cells have uh, the cholesterol. So if you eat a, you know, a lot of animal um, fats, you, you can get extra cholesterol. And depending upon various factors, how much you exercise, and blah, 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 all kinds of other things, it, it can, you can get what they call the good, good fats and the bad fats. And that's what I mentioned, I think, once before in this class. HDL and LDL, uh, and uh, HDL stands for high density lipoproteins, and LDL stands for low density, density lipoproteins. Lipoproteins. That's lipids combined with proteins, okay? And uh, HDLs are easily handled by your, your liver and all that. And, but the LDLs, we have a lot of that. They can kind of get clog, clog up your, your vessels. And so. Anyway. And so, so it, it, it gets a bad press to keep in mind. You do need, you make, but we make, we make our own. But if we get too much in our diet, then it can like cause some problems. Yeah. I was gonna say that's not a misnomer, but it's you don't get LDL just from eating animal fat. You no. Get LDL from eating screwed with animal fat like hydroxylated protein. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're right, you're right. So eating eating is any effort. No, no, and, and uh, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's hydrogenated fat, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and, <sighs> see the difference between the oils, which are liquid at room temperature, and the fats, which are solid at room temperature, and they want to make, you know, they want to make, say, margarine, uh, with the fats that are considered not such bad fats, but they're liquid at room temperature, so they partially hydrogenate them, so they are, well, at, at a lower temperature, they'll be solid, but then you're getting back into bad fats when you do that. Yeah. So, yeah, I know, you're absolutely right. It's not, it's, it's not just a cholesterol. You're absolutely right. Yeah? Is it also the working ones that work that animal meat? And how that affects like, the burgers and stuff? Good, yeah. That composition, they find that animals that eat more of a grass diet mm. or like traditional diet also have more beneficial fats in meat compared to like cows that are fed like. It could easily be. You know, you know, when I was a kid, and you'd go get, you know, meat at the, at the store, 
they made a big deal about how marbled the steak is. Oh, yeah. And the marbling was the fat. You know? Yeah. Uh, and and uh, um, they, they I'm but then since we've talked so much, I mean, not we, but I mean, you know, in the public health and all that, about the good fats and bad fats, and they're trying to cut back on the amount of fat. And so now, you know, they don't want such marbled meat. And like pork chops, they want them a lot less fatty than they used to be. So they totally changed the way they, you know, the, what what is now kind of considered the healthy the right thing to, to, to do. So like in the um, fairs, and, and, you know, you take, if you're, uh, you, you raise things and show them at the fair, the, the, the standards have changed for things like pigs and stuff like that. It's kind of what you want. You don't want the super fatty ones anymore. And anyway, it's all, it's all changing. It's all part of public health uh, decisions. Yeah. Uh, it's... <clears throat> they cut down on fat intake for a lot of things because of steroid intake for consuming animals. So fat cells take in all the hormones. Yeah. And antibiotics and all that stuff is put in the body. Yes. So you're eating fat from the animal. I know. This is the thing that bothers me. Is that you're right. actually right. They, 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 they feed all these antibiotics to the animals. animals yeah. And they're cumulative. So they will grow faster, so, you know, but then we're getting the residual... Uh, bits of those antibiotics in us when we eat the animal, plus you're increasing the chances of getting resistant bacteria that are resistant to uh, various kinds of antibiotics. And uh, anyway, so there are all, yeah, all kinds of bad problems in that sense. But, anyway, but we need to go on. <laughs> but you're, but you're, 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 a lot of these things, I mean, these are interesting topics. I, I, I'm glad to be talking about <coughs> Glycocalyx, this is an interesting term. Um, Mm -hmm. If you take botany, you'll see that word calyx. Um, so I can never remember exactly what a calyx is in botany. I'm not very good at botany, to tell you the truth. Um, but it's it's um, it's not the petal; it's the thing. I don't. Know. It's the bud, kind <laughs> of. It's it? it's like the little bud that, that yeah, yeah. spits forth a a pistol. No, Something. It's, 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 calyx is an improper word for weed, I know, but for on a plant. Um, isn't it just like the the base of the? Um, but it's not a leaf. The flower. It's, it's a really specific part. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's outside the ovary. Yeah, like yeah. Yeah, yeah. Something yeah. like that. But anyway, but so that that is but so that that's just a term. And if you take anatomy and, and talk about a calyx in the kidney, and it just it has it's a shape, not not a, it's not it has nothing with flowers, just a shape. But it, and the plural of calyx is calyces, but that's okay. Glycocalyx. Glyco refers to sugar. sugar. Okay. And a glycocalyx is some kind of a covering outside the cell. It's an outside covering. Outside the cell membrane. Um, okay, covering outside the membrane. And, um, but, but made of, made of, uh, sugars. Or sugars plus, or uh, um, sugars, I'll say plus other molecules. It, again, it depends on where, what organism we're talking about. But especially sugars, and that's what the word lipo means, sugar. Now, who makes it? I don't know. Bacteria, many bacteria do. Um, other cells, I'm, I'm not so sure. Some, oh, what are they? Uh, some um, um, organisms that live in, in rivers and stuff like that. And so what, what what is it for? Uh, it depends. It depends. It can be for it can be for um, protection. Protection. It can be for um, holding nutrients for future use. Uh, it can be to help an organism stick to something like in a river. It's flowing fast. It can help them stick to a rock so they don't just get, you know, swooshed down the river. Um, uh, attachment. Um, and it can also be for, oh, I was going to say receptors, but that's not quite accurate. But but um, it, it can help um, determine one kind of organism from another. You know, in other words, if the, uh, if the, Glycocalyx is 
of one organism will be made a certain way, and if it's slightly different, say, hey, you're not my friend, you're my enemy, because you're not the same. Not the same. Yeah, so it's for recognition. Not that it for recognition. Nothing you really need to worry about for our class. But if you read about a glycocalypse, some outside, some um, outside company. And, you know, usually it's, ex it's made by the organism to put outside the company. Okay. All right, let's talk about movement of molecules through the cell membrane. So, let's do this movement. Uh, molecules through. Cell membrane. Now, what do we say about the cell membrane? Phospholipid. What do we say about that? Phospholipid is, it's, it's, I mean, it's a good it's barrier. The right? It's a good barrier. What's it let through? It lets water, water. water usually, mm -hmm. and lipids, and lipids. Well, it's got the protein in it, but it's got water and lipids. It let lipids through. You know, we mentioned steroids. If you use a steroid cream, that, that, would, that would be absorbed through the, you know, into the cell. Um, so movement, movement. Um, okay, so uh, let's say, so this, the phospholipid allows. Oh, there's a lot of people who are good at this thing. Back to where we were. Movement molecules through cell membranes. Phospholipid, uh, phospholipid, uh, lipids allow. Uh, water to get through, usually, not always. And, um, uh, and, and lipids. Uh, water through and lipids. Okay. <laughs> but they don't let very much else go through. So, how do things get through cell membranes and all these other things? You know, like, uh, amino acids and sugars and uh, protein. I uh, not proteins, but but I mean ions is what I meant to say. And and go ahead. As I say, get through in the water. No, no, no. But but they're too big. They're too big, so they they don't go through the this part of the membrane. Where do they go through? Uh, the protein channels. Where do I have? I, I don't have it. But so we add the little right tubules. This part, right here. This part. The protein part. Remember, I, I had a thing last time about the functions of the membrane oh, proteins. Yeah. See. Oh, no, not that one, but we'll... The protein channels? No, no, channels. The channels, yeah, it was the tubes that oh, you were talking about, yeah, 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 the tubes. So, so, so that's the that's thing. Okay, so let's say, so, um, the proteins, the proteins, membrane proteins, membrane proteins, uh, can, remember they can act as channels and pumps, For, for certain specific molecules, for specific molecules. We're gonna come we're gonna come back to you know, these these kinds of ideas too. We'll come back to this thing and talk a little bit about this, but um well this active transfer, I want to ask it. Let's put that here for a while. Well, I should have had passive transport. Oh, there, let's do passive. Passive transport. Oh, I can't write this very well, sorry. Passive transport. Okay, um, that was Moses. So, um, but I'll come back to that in a minute. So, but let's let's just let's let's talk first about channels. So let me leave, leave off up oh, sorry. Let's just talk about channels. So it can act as channels for specific molecules. And, and we, as you said, it's like a tube. It's just mm -hmm. a tube that goes through the cell membrane. This is specific size and shape, the tube is, so that only certain molecules can get through. It, it, incredibly specific could be just sodium can get through and not the acids. And as I said before, those molecules, ions are so similar to each other. Um, so anyway, so so there are channels that can allow certain things through. 
but they have to follow um, but follow the laws of diffusion, which we'll talk a little bit about. Follow the laws of diffusion. Okay. And we'll, we'll come back to that, but that means that you can things are only going to move from where they're more concentrated to where they're less concentrated. You can't go backwards. You can't concentrate something. If, you, if it's just a channel, it's just passive. These are passive. But we're passive. No energy is expended. If there's a tube there, if there's a, if there's a channel there, and you've got, and it allows a certain thing through, and you have more of, uh, of that substance on one side than the other, then it will move through from where it's more concentrated to where it's Okay, we'll come back to that. I want to help you that. There are also um, membrane proteins that act as channels, pumps. Uh, and this, this is, uh, again, for specific molecules. But this, this can go against the laws of diffusion. Did security get here on the way? Oh, good. Okay, they're helping us. Thank you. For specific, okay, so pumps again, as I mentioned to you before, they're very specific. Only certain things can, can be pumped, but they use the term pump because energy you have to put energy into the system to make them work, right? So energy is required. Energy required. Um, so, can so the molecule, I'll say, so the molecules can be moved against a concentration gradient, which will make sense in this way. Against a concentration gradient. I agree to be concentration just for convenience. We'll hear you. Huh? I said we'll hear you. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so it's, it's like water. Water's always going to flow downhill. It's not going to flow uphill. You can go uphill, you have to pump. Uh, and the same thing, you know, if, if, if we're talking about just normal laws of diffusion, things should be fairly evenly distributed. If everything is ending up in one spot, you had to pump it there to get there. Put energy into the system. Question. Can you define a gradient? Oh, I'm going to actually. Give a good question. And if I don't get to it, I, I was planning on it. That you just see here it is the word. And I was going to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm sorry. So that's why I'm saying a few things here that aren't. I haven't really talked about. Yet. And, and I did say a little bit about the fusion ones here. So that we know. Um, so and I'll do that right now. Okay. But but so let's let's because uh, <coughs> I want to talk about it. oh active transport. Active transport is pump. That is a pump. These are pumps. And again, the word active means energy is put into the system. Okay, passive means you're not adding any energy to the system. It's just doing whatever it's doing, uh, just because of normal molecular motion. Okay, so now let's 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 talk about these terms: diffusion osmosis, so I can talk about gradients, and then it'll make more sense. So it's active trans active transfer. Are you going to go that separately, or is that oh, you know what? I I I don't really have to in the okay. sense of the pump. Um, yeah, it's really really it's the pumps. I guess I wasn't necessarily following what I had written there. Exactly. I was just kind of <laughs> talking about it. Okay, so let's well, let's talk about diffusion. And you know, I gave you that example last time of or maybe a couple of times ago about opening that jar of a bottle of ammonia and having it move around um, the room and. The smell is horrible. <laughs> so let's define diffusion. Let's define diffusion. I don't know if I wrote it down. Did I write it down for you? No. I did no. in a lab today, but did I, did I write it down before? Motion? So diffusion is the movement of a substance from where it's more concentrated. All right, we're concentrating on this stuff. To 
but where it's less concentrated. substance where it's more concentrated to where it's less concentrated. Now, a couple things here. How's it moving? And, and that, you know, the, the substance, it could be a liquid, it could be a gas, it could be a solid, it doesn't really matter. And what's it moving in? It could be a gas moving in a gas, it could be a gas moving in a liquid, it could be a liquid moving in a solid, it could be a liquid moving in a liquid. I, you know, I mean, any of these combinations work. How's it moving? Now, I, I didn't say anything about putting energy into the systems. Right? So this is passive. You're not pumping or anything, you're not pushing it. It's just moving. How? How's it moving? But what, 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 what did you say? From a high gradient to a gradient. Say it again. What? From a high gradient to a low gradient. It is moving from, yes, that is true, but, but how is it moving? I mean, it's not taking the bus. What's moving it? Okay, you could have an electrical thing. Here we're not talking electrical. Right, I think you, you mean dissolution. Gradients, but in this case, we're talking just just concentration things, normal molecular motion. Okay, just normal molecular motion. Molecules are always moving. I mean, we don't see them. I mean, they're too tiny to see, right? But 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 if you if you were looking at atoms and stuff, I gave you some numbers once, you know, about how rapidly these things are moving back and forth, millions and millions of times a second. I mean, these are beyond our conception because we're used to the macro world. We're not used to the micro. world. Okay. But if you're on the level of, of, an, of a, uh, molecules, they're just moving rapidly. Now, what happens if you raise the temp? They go faster. They go faster. Yeah, okay. So, so obviously you expect the fusion to occur faster at a higher temperature because the molecules are moving faster. So these are just randomly moving. The molecules are just randomly moving. And when I gave that example of taking that jar of ammonia and opening the thing up, and those molecules are bouncing around in there, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of them in here. They're highly concentrated inside the jar. Where there's no ammonia out in the room. And these things are bouncing around. It's far more likely that those molecules are going to bounce around and come out of the jar and start moving around the room than it is for if it ever gets all, you know, if all those molecules get even to this first around the room. It's pretty unlikely that they're all going to come bouncing back into that jar, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, re and remember I said this, and it's something to think about. The universe runs on statistics. You know, when we're talking huge numbers of things, we can we can talk about what's going to happen, and it's it's going to make sense. The universe runs on statistics, so you have huge number of molecules of ammonia in that jar, and all the ammonia outside in the room. It's far more likely that those molecules will move out of the jar and move around the room than if you have them even dispersed, that they're all going to come to that one jar. Could happen, but I mean, you know, listen, the, the chance is one out of point oh 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 oh. I mean, it's so close to zero, it's equivalent to zero. Yeah. Would it be the fusion if you had like two ounces of orange juice and you put it in eight ounces of water? Would well, the okay. orange juice be Well, so you're diluting it. Yes. You're diluting it. You're diluting it. Diffusion might yeah. occur. If you just had the, the orange juice here and it was surrounded by the water, it would slowly. Dilute itself, but of course you're mixing it so it's rapidly mixing, so you're mixing it by convection. But that's a, that that would be a dilution. Let, 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 let me go a little further to see if, if, if maybe what you're asking is my, my money. Oh, I just didn't know if that would be. Uh, a well, we'd use the word uh, dilution for that. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the idea of diffusion would be, you know, if you have over here, you have some substance here, whatever the substance is, and it's round, surrounded by whatever this is, not, not much of it. Some of these molecules will move out. And occasionally, um, you know, that, that would be, it'd be moving like that. And so if you took that more concentrated juice and put water around it, that would start happening. So it would be. If you just mix them, then you're diluting it. Okay, so would evaporation be a fusion? No, evaporation has to do with water molecules going so fast that they go from the liquid state okay. to the gaseous state. But so this would be diffusion. And by the way, when even with that, um, you know, this this could be the example of that could be the jar of ammonia, and, and the ammonia is slowly moving out. So, I mean, sometimes an ammonia molecule would move back in. You know, it's like it won't happen. It's just that you're not going to get a whole lot of them coming back in versus how many are going out. Does that make sense? That's what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's a number thing. It's a statistical thing.
then the universe runs on statistics. All right. Go oh, away. That was another question. I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Wouldn't a prime example of diffusion be when, uh, in our lab when we dye our cheek cells? Yeah. You have your drop of water with your cheek cells in it, and you drop the tiny little drop of, of blue dye. in the corner, no. and then it. Technically, it. it would be a good analogy. I think. And the problem with the diffusion is it's such a slow process. This week in lab, you're actually going to do uh, a thing which where it is mostly diffusion going on. You can take some auger plates and you're going to make a hole. Couple little wells in the auger plate. You can put a couple of dyes in. The dyes going to diffuse the auger. And auger is is actually is, we use it in our micro lab to, to add nutrients and to grow bacteria on it. But auger is sort of like gelatin. It's actually thicker than gelatin, but it's just it's just a semi-solid kind of thing. And in that case, the molecules are diffusing into the auger with very little convection going on. It's mostly diffusion. Um, whereas what you're talking about is capillary action. It's like I'm going to do that again. Anyway, we're full, let's go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> full in, it's going to be by capillary action, it's going to pull it in. And it will mix. But again, a lot of the mixture is convection. A little bit yeah. of diffusion. A little bit of diffusion. Yeah. Just a but it's a good analogy of diffusion. Yeah. Yeah. And anyway, so diffusion is just a little bit of something where it's more concentrated where it's less concentrated. Uh, and, and when you talk about gradients, you talk about different concentrations. That's really what gradients is talking about. The word gradient refers to different concentrations. Gradients refers to, or a gradient, okay. A gradient refers to uh, different concentrations or something. What's the name of the substance? So a gradient refers to different concentrations of the substance. So, uh, and so when you talk about something moving down its concentration gradient, all that's saying is it's moving from where it's more concentrated to where it's less concentrated. That, that, that's what that term means. So let's actually write that. So um, if something is... And this is a term they use, moving down its concentration gradient. Concentration gradient. So if something is moving down its concentration gradient, it's going where it's more concentrated or where it's less concentrated. So the word gradient is just a fancy word for concentration. <laughs> differences. Does that help in what you were asking earlier? Well, I'm not understanding the difference between the gradient and diffusion. Well, no, no. Uh, diffusion says, hey, you know, <coughs> here's how molecules are moving. It's a little more concentrated than less concentrated. And if you're looking at something and you say, yeah, hey, you know, here's here's where there's a lot of something, here's a little bit less of that, here's a little bit less of that, okay, there's a concentration gradient. Uh, and so the things are going to move down, <coughs> meaning, meaning, meaning it's going to follow the laws of diffusion. Okay. If there's a concentration gradient, molecules will move all the laws of the future. More concentrated to get the rest. Does that make sense? Sort of? So you're saying like a slow rise or a drop in, in, in the means of gradient. Gotcha. That'd be a gradient. Yeah, yeah. But you could use the term not just for concentrations. You, you, could, you could talk about a gradient of, of uh, uh, like speed or something like that. You mm -hmm. could use those terms. It's just a change, a difference you know, mm -hmm. in amount. Now, osmosis, I mean, osmosis is used in all kinds of funny ways, but the actual meaning of osmosis, osmosis is the diffusion of water. That's all it is. <laughs> okay? All it is. And I know people use the term, you know, 
put my textbook over my head and then we'll maybe by osmosis I'll get Suck it in. Well, of course, that's a, it's, a, it's a fun joke, but it's not. It's a wrong use of the word osmosis because you know, the word osmosis is strictly talking about the diffusion of water. And it's going to follow its laws of diffusion from where it's more concentrated to where it's less concentrated. It follows the normal laws of diffusion. So I'll put that from where it's more concentrated to where it's less concentrated. Um, what you'll see in the lab is that they tend to define solutions by the concentration of what's dissolved in the water, not by the concentration of water. Which is okay, it's fine, as long as I understand it. But the point is that, that still water is always going to move from where it's more concentrated to where it's less concentrated. And by the way, when you're talking about diffusion, or osmosis, we have a, by the way, just another thing, one, one little thing, it's a minor point. And, and it only will come into play if you take chemistry. Um, technically, osmosis refers to the diffusion of wherever the solvent is. But of course, in biological systems, it's always water. So that's why I put the diffusion of water. But if you said this to a chemist, they say, well, it doesn't have to be water. What if the, the, what if the uh, um, solvent is ammonia, for example? Okay, then it would be the diffusion of ammonia. So, but for biological systems, Osmosis is obviously referring to water because that's the solvent. So, anyway, um, now what was I just to say? The other, by the way, the other, by the way, by the way, water diffusion. Um, oh, when I was going to talk about diffusion, when I said the movement of substance from where it's more concentrated to where it's less concentrated, all each thing thinks about is itself. Uh, molecules are very self-centered. All they think about is themselves. So if you're looking at Sodium, for example, the concentration of sodium in, in, in one part of a, one area versus another, is it going to move by diffusion? It strictly depends upon the concentration of itself in one place versus itself somewhere else. It doesn't care how much potassium there is or calcium there is. All it cares about is itself. Same thing for water. Water doesn't care what's dissolved anywhere. All it cares about is itself. How much of me is here? How, what's my concentration here versus my concentration over here? And if I'm more concentrated here, then I'll move to over here where I'm less concentrated. Whether I'm water or I'm sodium or calcium or I'm oxygen or anything else, it doesn't really matter what we're talking about. Whatever you're talking about, the only thing that is important is its own self, its concentration in one place versus another. Am I making sense? Are you guys kind of. I, I, I mean. Me? I get what diffusion is if, if since you use the analogy with ammonia, the same right. thing could probably be true if you took open a, open up a bottle of vodka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just it's it, and with water, it probably happens on warmer days where it starts to bump up and you get mist and all that stuff. But, that's that's the yeah. whole yeah. diffusion idea, right? Yeah. It's just moving. just moving. But but why this becomes important is what's happening in cells. Question. Yeah, there's a part in the book about being Mm -hmm. We talked about how things go to their lowest energy. Is diffusion considered them going to where they have to do the least amount of work? Yeah. The lowest energy yeah. Them, so That's right. Okay. It's more stable. And, you know, if you have a whole bunch of things concentrated here, then hey, it, it somehow it took some work to get all the like the ammonia molecules all concentrated in that bottle. And it's much better if they're all just hanging out all over the place, you know. That's a more stable place for all those ammonia molecules. Just sort of hanging out. But doesn't that have to do with like the molecular weight of like the well, mass? But the molecular weight will have an effect on how fast it moves. But it'll still happen. It'll still happen. It'll still diffuse. The lower the molecular weight, the faster it'll move. By the way, that's something that, you know, if you've ever, ever breathed helium in. Like <laughs> helium. You sound like Donald Duck talking because helium is one fourth of basically the weight of uh, normal air, and you're used to breathing normal air and having your voice come out. But suddenly the molecules are moving faster, so your voice goes up in pitch. That's so awesome. Um, but anyway, whatever. But but okay. So but the point I'm trying to make here is that just these things are moving, um, um, just because there's differences in concentration. Or another way to say differences in concentration is there a, there's concentration gradient, okay? 
all that concentration gradient is saying, hey, we have different concentrations. And when we, and, but it's important that you understand that when they say moving down a concentration gradient, it means going from more concentrated to less concentrated. That's all passive. This is just the way things are going to move if you don't put any energy in the system. And if you want to move something against a concentration gradient, you're going to have to pump it. Like moving water uphill, you have to pump it. It's not going to go by itself. It's just the way things are. So let's put this over here. To move something against a concentration gradient, in other words, Concentrate it somewhere. Concentrate whatever that something is. <coughs> um, energy must be put into the system. Pumps. Does that make sense? So, to concentrate something, that's what I was saying, if you had that ammonia all sort of evenly dispersed around the, the room, it's, it's totally, you know, dilute it. But if you want to concentrate all that ammonia into a jar, you're going to have to get some kind of an ammonia pump, something that can grab the ammonia molecules out of the air and put them into the jar. Or in your cells, cell membranes, we have various kinds of pumps that will pump things. You know, I mentioned we have sodium pumps and potassium pumps, or potassium. We have all kinds of pumps. And, they can, and I mentioned to you iodine. Remember I mentioned iodine? We have in your thyroid, right? Iodine pumps. And they can take the iodine out of your, you know, out of your blood. Of course, again, you get that from eating, you know, vegetables and the Put it all in the thyroid. So, so powerful, powerful iodine. Concentrate But how can you concentrate it? You expect it by normal diffusion to be evenly distributed. So you have to concentrate it means <coughs> going against the concentration. You need to pump. You need to put in energy. And the energy we'll talk about you know, coming up uh, not today, but uh, ATP and stuff like that. Now, is this sort of making some sense? Now, you're going to do some stuff in the lab. Uh, well, I don't get the gradient now. Dealing with diffusion osmosis, and I hope that sort of helps a little bit. I get it. The last thing I want to talk about, um, exocytosis and endocytosis, those are fancy words. Um, uh, and, and those are different. In the old days, we used different words. We used, in, uh, we used penocytosis and phagocytosis. Oh, my God, it gets so complicated. Um, so let's write those words down. Exocytosis. Exocytosis. That's moving something out of a cell. X, X means out. Yeah. CYT stands for cell. So you're moving something out of a cell. Moving something out of a cell. Usually something large. Membrane or channels or pumps. For example, proteins. Proteins are big molecules. Proteins can't go through the cell membrane normally. They're way too big. Um, endocytosis is just the opposite, it's moving something in. Large into the cell. Okay. 
In the old days, if you see the word phagocytosis, that means cell eating. So the cells can take things in by phagocytosis. And that would be taking in something that's sort of you know, particular. Penocytosis was cell drinking. I don't know, we usually just use these nowadays. It's better. Now, what's the deal? Let's, let's talk about this real quickly. And I think we have just enough time. Maybe we'll just kind of do it again on Wednesday to make sure. But cell membranes, were they made up again? Protein, proteins, and the phospholipids are pretty similar to each other, right? There's a little difference in the proteins, right, from one cell to another, but the phospholipid parts are pretty similar. So, um, so let's take here. Let's the phosphorus uh, says uh, here. So here is going to be a cell, and that's the cell membrane in black. And here is going to be something here, some kind of a particle here. It's going to be some membrane-bound thing. Membrane-bound. Thing. Oh, I like that thing. It doesn't really tell you much about that. <laughs> in this case, in this case, it's going to be some protein for transport. Okay, it's going to be some protein for transport. But here, but the membrane brown thing has in it. So we'll say maybe these are proteins. And 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 your cell wants to get rid of these membrane brown proteins to be to be. Uh, you know, like it could be a hormone that you a protein hormone that you bought yourself want to secrete. Membrane bound protein, membrane bound proteins to uh, be removed from the cell or secreted from the cell. Well, now these, these things are way too big. These proteins, protein molecules are way too big to go through the membrane. Um, but what did I say about membranes? They're similar to each other, right? Membranes are similar to each other. The nice thing about it, have you ever taken two soap bubbles? Take two soap bubbles and you touch them together and you can make one big soap bubble, right? Because those soap, soap bubbles are made of the same thing. They just join together. That's exactly what happens with these membranes. So what happens is, I'll, I'll do this kind of picture. What will happen then is this thing will come up to the surface. This the thing I have in blue will come up to the surface like this. This is exocytosis, by the way. Okay, so that membrane thing that's inside the cell, the membrane comes up, comes in contact with the cell membrane, and then they join with each other. They join with each other. So now, and and what's going to happen here? It's going to go like this. It's going to. And these things have the proteins in here, right? Well, I should put the proteins in the other cup, but I didn't. So they join with each other, and then this blue membrane becomes part of the regular membrane. It's made of the same stuff. And so then these little blue proteins, which are kind of big, just escape. They escape from the cell. Does that make any sense what happened? Yep. So the, the, this, the, this membrane-bound thing, whatever this is, join. Is the person okay? Mm -hmm. Is the person okay? Yeah. And, and they're taking care of her now? Good, thank you. Anyway. So, but the point is that, that, that the, the membrane of whatever this particle is in here that's containing these proteins just actually joins with the actual cell membrane and then it just opens up and releases it, whatever it was. This is a way for big things such as maybe proteins to get out of the cell, because otherwise they can't go through the, through the cell membrane, but if they're enclosed in a, in a membrane structure, that membrane structure can be joined. Endocytosis is a same idea, but the exact opposite. And by the way, this is how things like uh, you know some of your your lymphocytes and, and some of the, uh, some of the other cells are eat up bacteria. This is how they get things like bacteria inside the cell to eat them. Bacteria is still way too big to get through cell membranes. But in this case, we'd say, hey, maybe here's the cell. Here's your cell. Here's maybe a bacterium here. It doesn't have to be a bacterium. I'm just using that as an idea. Here's a bacterium right here. And it'll, it'll start surrounding it. It'll just kind of come like this. And uh, it'll kind of surround this bacterium like this. And then it'll keep on enclosing it. So eventually, you know, it'll, it'll, it will say, and then it'll try to get this in this other way. Here we go. And it enclosed it until the outside of the, the cell membrane meets and rejoins? Yeah.
terrible picture of getting flustered here. Um, I wanted to have this guy come around and <laughs> Surrounding this little bacterium like this, and then the next picture would be with it inside. This has this little particle inside. What's happened is this the cell took in the bacteria by kind of surrounding with the cell membrane, but the cell membrane comes around and attaches to itself, pinches off, comes inside, but it's surrounded with bacteria. So now inside the cell is that bacteria surrounded by some membrane. And then the cell can take care of it from there. Mm -hmm. Lysosomes that are mission to you to digest it. So exocytosis is a way to get like proteins or victims like that out of the cell. Exocytosis is a way to get things. I use the example of bacteria, which is even bigger than protein, to get it inside the cell. And there's no way it can go through the cell. Does that make sense? Sorry. Yeah. Huh. I'll see you guys on <laughs> Wednesday. They're ready. I'm going to pass it out and have a panic attack. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what's going on, but is there a way to contact the office? Do you have, do you have a phone you can call? He's on it. Okay, I'll let you do it. Thank you. How do you know? You just get out there and see? Yeah, I just walked by okay. and someone was. Yeah, yeah, Hang on, let me just see. We can contact you. Okay. I'll edit this part. Mm. It was almost like she was having a stroke because I was trying to talk to her and she was trying to put words together, but it just wasn't coming out the way she wanted to. Yeah. Yeah, there was some folks outside I grabbed what looked to be like a janitor for the security guard. I don't know. Yeah. Where were we? Sorry about that. Yeah, that's that's a shame. Okay, I think she's gonna be okay, but she's not reactivated. I'm sure this should be up to her. I was never good at trauma. That's why <laughs> my, my dad was a doctor. He he actually uh, was he was very good in trauma. He was in the Second World War and the Korean War. And he trained other physicians to be in the MASH units, and you know about MASH. Yeah, you know, the mer MASH medical and movies. surgical hospitals. So after the MASH, was just going to ask my dad, did you, did, you, did, you, did you work in the MASH units? As well, he said, I trained other physicians. I remember the other people that he was worked with. Back in the he was trained. And his twin brother, yeah, twin brother was also a doctor. He was in my twin, my uncle was in the MASH. They never talked about it, and I don't know if they had the fun and games. I they doubt it. Movies and stuff. They did. Uh, it's a good series on TV. I have to admit. But anyway, he was good with trauma. So I, I you know, and I go, I'm not good with trauma. So I'm glad to get people out there who are good because <laughs> we need those people working on ambulances and stuff like that. I don't know why we got a guy. Poor kid. 